Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel, we have Luca or Lusa Pasquariello. One of these days, we'll have someone on the channel that has a pronounceable name. Plant-based nutrition and fitness. So since he's plant-based, we already know that the chances of him being an insufferable prick are quite high. The chances, not all of them are. It's not invariably the case. But this is a Instagram reel or an Instagram reel. Someone should do a critique video on my grammar. On someone who I believe to be carnivore mom of four on Instagram. I'm not quite sure right now as to what her username is. It is something along those lines, though. It is a reaction video to her, and so we're just gonna go ahead and see exactly what is being said here. So, let's jump right into this. But first, just like always, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already in order to gain access to one week early uploads, one extra video per week, ad-free content, and uncensored content. And also, find my book Contraindicated if you haven't already. And with that being said, now let's jump directly into the video. Yes, my arteries are blocked. I am on my- Okay, okay. Before we get started, just to explain the context, this is a reaction that he is doing. Her video is right here on the screen. This is the carnivore diet clogged my arteries, of course, to be sensational, and her video is a response to a comment that says, how about your arteries? Now, to give the benefit of the doubt, they maybe weren't being sarcastic or insulting, but either way, it was said, and this is her response. Deathbed with excellent blood work, normal kidney function, liver function, A1C. I am just literally about to die. But let me explain to you what really causes heart disease. People think just because they eat their little fruits and vegetables that it's saving their life. Well, it's not. Let me tell you why. Heart disease has been linked to a metabolic disease, meaning chronic- Correct. Before you even move forward, correct. High insulin, chronically high blood sugar. Okay, so chronically high blood sugar is what causes the chronically elevated insulin. Chronically elevated insulin itself is not damaging. There's been no evidence to suggest that, but the elevated blood glucose is an exacerbator of the heart disease process because of the glycation that occurs given a hyperglycemic event. Glucose itself is a six carbon aldehyde, it is an aldohexose, and aldehydes, even in vastly small concentrations, destroy lipid rafts, tear cell membranes to pieces, bind to DNA and cause mutations to it, and in a high enough concentration will kill cells outright. All aldehydes do this. Aldehydes are usually the result of oxidation products of polyunsaturated fatty acids and also just from oxygen utilization itself in the mitochondria. A lot of people don't realize that we are symbiotes for mitochondria. Oxygen itself was a waste product billions of years ago from the first photosynthetic organisms and other organisms surrounding plants had to find a way of utilizing that oxygen, that highly reactive molecule, because we know that oxygen is highly reactive, in order to flourish in the environment. Mitochondria were one of them, and once they started utilizing oxygen, there were oxidation products, and so they had to form antioxidants. Really, it was the eukaryotic organism that it was engulfed by us that developed antioxidants to prevent this, like glutathione, like uric acid, really urate and physiological pH is what it presents as, and etc., etc., really. So there are inflammatory products that are formed even within our bodies right now, just from breathing oxygen. The primary driver of heart disease, the cause of heart disease, is inflammation. A big driver of that is high blood pressure. It's really pressure, but high blood pressure is typically caused by inflammation. It's a feedback loop. It is a massive feedback loop. High blood pressure can be caused by elevated insulin as well because that increases blood volume by causing retention of salt and water, and that is caused by sugar because fat does not raise your insulin. Protein does, but it doesn't spike it. It does not cause hyperinsulinemia. So yes, this woman is correct when saying that blood sugar is an exacerbator of heart disease. Where do you get sugar from? In all of its forms, to any significant degree, plants, among many other toxins as well. And too much sugar in your blood is toxic. Correct. That is what diabetes is. Sugar in your blood is diabetes. Too much sugar in your exactly. brain is dementia and Alzheimer's. Too much sugar in your ovaries is PCOS. And the list goes on. When you eat your little fruits and vegetables and low-fat stuff, you're still continuing to be a carb burner. Mm, no. Yes, in fact, actually, you are. There's a reason that glucose, the prototypical sugar, is utilized first within the body. It is because of its toxicity. Alcohol is also utilized first, before fat. Protein isn't utilized for oxidation purposes, so we'll leave that out of this. It's one thing that science is certain about. No, you do not understand science. You know how I know that? Because you're plant-based. If you're going to refer to inferential statistics, inferential statistics is not in the business and states nothing about causality. It can only disprove hypotheses. And if you're going to try and use inferential statistics to disprove this hypothesis, go ahead. But do not say anything about LDL causing anything, cholesterol causing anything. 
And it's the fact that there is no be-all, end-all diet. Well, it depends on what you mean by be-all and end-all. If you mean there is not one diet for every single human being on the face of the planet, you would be false. Because every single animal on the face of the planet has one diet for its species. One species-appropriate, species-specific diet for its species. You cannot find me one animal in the wild that is eating a different diet than another version of that animal of the same species right next to it. They eat the same diet, okay? The carnivore diet is not a part of that definition, or at least not in the long term. Today, I would like... What, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that there's no studies to inform upon its efficacy and safety per se long term? There are no studies to inform upon the efficacy and or safety of any diet long term, because there are no studies to inform upon cause and effect relationships with respect to dietary intervention and lifestyle intervention as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed, and in fact, the entirety of inference statistics because you cannot impose complete control over human beings. Point out something that the carnivore tribe is being hypocritical about. Fair enough. Go ahead and say that and you may or may not be right. There is hypocrisy in every space. You may be correct. Let's find out. So she mentions metabolic disease. Metabolic disease is not what she said. She said it was a metabolic disorder, heart disease. Metabolic disease is a construct predicated upon proxy measures, like fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin, blood pressure, and even ratios like waist to height, etc., etc. That is a construct high blood sugars, and so on and so forth. Yes, yes, that is one exacerbator of heart disease because heart disease is an inflammatory condition. Unequivocally, unambiguously, we know that for a fact. One question for this woman. How do you know that high blood sugar levels or, for example, high blood pressure, which is a part of metabolic disease, is being detrimental for your health. Okay, good question. Because of the fact that metabolic disease is once again a construct, so to attribute the cause of the disease processes that ostensibly result from metabolic disease to one of the proxy measures that constitute the construct, that being metabolic disease, like fasting blood glucose or fasting insulin, well, that's inappropriate to do so. What we know, though, is that elevated blood glucose causes damage. That's why diabetes is deadly. There have been no established studies that have shown that insulin itself is damaged. All we know is that if you elevate insulin high enough, it can perturb the equilibrium that is disallowing and preventing further entry of glucose into cells and force glucose into cells when the cells are purposely disallowing the entry, which can expedite and exacerbate damage. But that's still not really the result of insulin. The glucose is still the thing inducing damage. We also know that glucose spikes your insulin if you consume it exogenously to a significant enough of a degree, which depending on who you are will vary in terms of the amount that's required to do such a thing. And insulin is an anabolic hormone involved in muscle protein synthesis, sure, but also relevant to this context fat storage and fat creation, actually. The creation of new fatty acids, which will increase adiposity because it'll form triglycerides and triglycerides are fats necessarily to be stored when they are formed. And depending on who you are and what your genetics are, that will determine where you store it. But much of the time it is in the stomach, especially if you're a man. So that affects the waist to height ratio. We know on a biochemical basis what sugar does in excess. And that is why she is saying hyperglycemia. She also didn't mention blood pressure. You're mentioning it because you said that she mentioned metabolic disease. She didn't mention metabolic disease. She said heart disease is a metabolic disorder. That's what she said, and she's correct. How do you personally know and determine that you have diabetes or high blood pressure? How did we come up with those numbers? I guess you are relying on science. Those numbers and associations were basically determined by probably three methods. Method number one is observational. Method number two is randomized controlled trials and- Well, there's no such thing as any true randomized controlled trials because in order to actually perform a randomized controlled trial, you have to take two genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical, separate them at birth, put them into two metabolic ward lock-in rooms and observe them over their entire lives if attempting to infer lifelong health outcomes, 40 years for 40 year long health outcomes, etc., and control for every single variable, including the time they wake up, the time they go to bed, their stress levels, their hormone levels, the time they eat, etc., etc. It's implausible for obvious reasons, it's also unethical, it wouldn't get passed an ethics committee, rightfully so, and it's exorbitantly expensive, but okay. These are other observational studies, really. It's just not colloquially referred to as such. Okay, it's, it's theory generating, it is theology. If we have any data, then genetic studies come into play as well. Now, let's use high blood sugar levels and high blood pressure as an example here. So let's go through some evidence together and then I will tell you exactly why I personally feel like the carnivore tribe is so hypocritical. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead.
obviously won't go through all the evidence. I just want to point out some of, in my humble opinion, good, well-constructed studies. We start- Okay, so I just want to pause and say this is refreshing to see someone that is actually not an insufferable prick in the plant-based community. It was extremely refreshing. So, I'm not going to bring as much animosity to the table here. Off with something that many of the carnivore tribes seem to be despising, and that's observational data. This met Yes, because of the fact that even though observational data serves a purpose, it cannot establish causal relationships between any heart health outcome or disease process as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time. Observational studies are usually epidemiological. They're prospective cohort studies. The problem with those, well, there's many. First of all, it can only establish associations like I just said. Second of all, the results are usually adjusted for at the end of studies via a process called multivariate regression, which involves stacking multiple univariate regressions on top of your original one that you actually formulated and calculated, under the false assumption that doing so will bring you closer and closer to establishing a causal relationship because you're quote-unquote controlling for confounders like blood pressure, etc. But each one of those regressions has a contributory error mathematically, so therefore what you get is an inflation of the power of the result and an exact antithetical result in terms of what you're actually doing. You're bringing yourself less and less to a causal relationship. In many cases, it doesn't just inflate the power of the result, though. It changes the entire result from something that was not studied, which makes it fabricated. It makes it fallacious. Scientists report what they observed, not what they think they would have observed if they had done the study differently in an ideal world where they could impose complete control over human beings they were studying and observing. Number three is publication bias. Epidemiologists are prevented from publishing studies in epidemiological journals that disprove their hypothesis. That skews things. You've got arbitrary selection criteria where epidemiologists can choose whatever criteria they like when publishing studies, so English only, men only, etc., just allowing them to give more control over which studies are published and which ones aren't. You've got the reporting of relative outcome statistics as opposed to absolute outcome statistics, where everything is in percentages and ratios as opposed to absolute values. That's a problem. The problem of extrapolation. The results and findings of epidemiological studies can only be extrapolated to the group study to the demographic or demographics studied. So if the studies were done on very aged populations, which is usually done in order to ensure the occurrence of deaths within epidemiological studies, they can only be extrapolated to that age group, for example, among other traits. Many, many, many problems with epidemiology. That's why we're not a fan of it. Epidemiology has its uses in establishing possible links between variables. That is what it is used for. Of 102 prospective studies looked at diabetes. Okay, so this is this is a meta-analysis looking at 102 prospective cohort studies. I don't care. The number of studies, it could say 1,002 prospective cohort studies. I just covered why that doesn't matter. Or I should say fasting blood glucose concentration levels and the risk of vascular... Well, that's important to distinguish. Yes, you should say that. Diabetes mellitus, fasting blood glucose concentration, and risk of cardiovascular disease. So, not risk. Do you see that word risk there? That is a cause and effect claim. That is a cause and effect term to be sensational. That is irresponsible. This is inferential statistics, which cannot inform upon cause and effect. Never does it ever make any claims about causality. Without further computation, you cannot inform upon causality. And by computation, I mean machinery. And even then, it's difficult. Disease. Let's not glance over the fact that they included 102 prospective studies here. I cover that, the number doesn't matter. It came to the conclusion that people with diabetes had a twofold increased risk for vascular diseases. Well, not risk. My opinion is that that's probably the case, but that's an opinion. This is a claim of extreme irresponsible conviction. Okay, not risk independent from other risk factors. No, not risk factors. So what they did is they controlled, didn't they? Well, when I say controlled, I mean they did exactly what I just said they did. They adjusted the results at the end. So it's fabrication. What did they actually observe? Anyway, diabetes, a disease characterized exclusively and explicitly as chronically elevated blood glucose, is caused, in the case of type 2 diabetes, invariably by carbohydrate consumption. You cannot, and I mean this, you cannot find me someone, you will not find someone that has type 2 diabetes that does not consume carbohydrates to some degree. You will not find me anyone. There are things such as statins and seed oils, really the oxidation products and all these other things that cause inflammation, that can and will lower the threshold that one has to surpass or achieve in order to develop diabetes. But carbohydrates are required for the process. The reason why people with diabetes have issues is because the elevated glucose causes damage. That's why it is measured measured by blood glucose levels. That's why we measure them in the first place. Okay? Okay.
Let's move on to the next step of evidence. And that was it. What was the point of that? Well, maybe maybe you're formulating an argument and that was the first step of formulation. So if that's the case, then okay, fine. So, so we got that down. It makes sense. You already covered the faults though, but anyway. Randomized trials. Mm, Cover that too. But anyway, we'll, we'll look into this. Randomized trials wanted to answer the question whether weight loss can put type 2 diabetes into remission. Okay, well, that's already predicated upon a false notion that weight gain causes diabetes. Weight gain is a symptom of poor dietary input. So anyway, the type 2 diabetes would be causing the weight gain. And in reality, not type 2 diabetes. The diabetes itself isn't causing the weight gain. It's the sugar consumption that leads to an insulin spike that causes the creation of new fatty acids. The glucose can cause an increased production of glycerol. Those fatty acids can then be esterified to a glycerol molecule and then form a triglyceride, and then they can mobilize into adipocytes to be stored. Fat cells. It's all sugar consumption. Anyway, primary care-led weight management for remission of type 2 diabetes, an open-label cluster randomized trial. Cluster a randomized trial. So that was the method of randomization. There are different methods of randomization. And the results are astounding, to say the okay. least. People that lost around 10 to 15 kilograms of body weight had uh, 86% to put type 2 diabetes into remission. So okay, however, what you need to understand is that the methods employed to lose that weight are what are important to assess, because type 2 diabetes can be put into remission with a plant-based diet. And that has to do with Randall cycle phenomena, or the Randall cycle phenomenon is what I should say. Okay, I've done a video on the Randall cycle phenomenon, and I should probably do another one because I didn't do the best job, in my opinion, of explaining it as well as I could, as granularly as I could, really. I think people got a sort of warped message, and that was my fault and not theirs. In this study, used MRI scan to look at the fat deposits in the liver. And this saw a great reduction in the fat deposits in the liver. But you need to observe what they used to decrease the weight. What happened was they employed dietary restriction onto them, or a dietary alteration is what we should say, that resulted in both an amelioration of many people's diabetes, or remission of it, in their words, as well as a loss in weight. What you are irresponsibly, tacitly implying here is that the weight loss is what resulted in the diabetes remission. And and that is what is irresponsible here, okay? It was also associated with a loss of fat around the organs, particularly the liver. But even when assessing the dietary intervention that was imposed, even though this was the result of it, that does not necessarily mean that that is an indicated dietary approach for human beings. What other dietary interventions can result in the exact same result, if not to a greater degree? Perhaps we should be looking at that and considering that. This is how you should interpret statistics, okay? pancreas and other key organs when it comes to diabetes and blood sugar management. And of course, there's many more uh, randomized trials done on diabetes, but this is just a little glimpse. And I also don't want to waste too much of your time talking about type 2 diabetes here, because we are here to talk about something else. And it's the hypocrisy of the carnivore tribe. But for the time being, let's move on to blood pressure. This systematic review and meta-analysis included 100 24 core studies. Okay, we already covered that the number of cohort studies is not what matters, okay? More than 1.2 million individuals. And they saw that elevated levels of systolic blood pressures are a major risk factor for- No, not risk factor, associative factor ischemic heart disease in both women and men. Now that builds up some confidence and of course we also need to test it out in very controlled settings. Well, <laughs> you say very controlled, oftentimes it's not very controlled. It is never completely controlled. Such as randomized controlled trials. This systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials looked at blood pressure controls in older people with and without diabetes. And the results are as follows. Intensive blood pressure control reduces the risk of not risk and not reduces. Both of those are cause and effect claims. Cardiovascular outcomes in older hypertensive patients. We had a look at observational data. Look, we understand that high blood pressure will cause inflammation. Cause is a word that is appropriate to use there. We know the mechanism as to how it does such a thing. We know what inflammation will do. It seems to be a feedback loop where inflammation will result in higher blood pressure, which will result in further inflammation, which will whole feedback loop there. Uh, randomized control trials. And now let's have a look at genetic data. Now, Mendelian randomization looks... No. Oh, goodness. Let's not talk about Mendelian randomization. 
at people that have a genetic predisposition to answer some questions. For example, the following Mendelian randomization we are going to look at is at people that have a higher blood pressure genetically. There are certain genes in your body that force your body to have a higher blood pressure. And perhaps I haven't looked into that personally. It could be the case that those people that exhibit those genes typically have higher blood pressure, but there's no direct link to that, actually. I need to look at that. In my opinion, that seems to be the case. However, we also need to clear up this misconception about genes. Genes are designed to encode for the production of a specific protein and nothing else. It does so in response to external stimuli. The environment environment that you are surrounded in. Some of that you don't have control over. Much of it you do, because the food you eat is part of the environment that I'm speaking of. So genes are either activated, deactivated, or somewhere in between in terms of their production rate of that protein. This philosophy about pleiotropy, this philosophy that your genes will have an indefinite effect on health outcomes, is quite lacking. So that's another point to add. So even if these genes are involved in producing proteins that will cause higher blood pressure, there is something that can stimulate and do the opposite of stimulate the production of that protein by said gene. That's another thing we need to get straight. It doesn't really matter if you do a kind of like sports, eat healthy, or you don't drink or you don't smoke, the blood pressure stays high within those people. And this Mendelian randomization study was conducted on Chinese adults. Most of these people, these authors or these scientists, will observe people that exhibit those genes over the course of a very long period of time, so it'll still be a prospective cohort study, and never regularly measure their blood pressure. We saw that in the randomization, the Mendelian randomization study of LDL. It's just ridiculous. Again, I have to look at these myself, but anyway. And they found that the sooner we can treat high blood pressure, yes, even in younger ages, the better the cardiovascular disease outcomes will be. Well, not will be. It's pretty clear that high blood pressure and high blood sugar is not a good thing. Now, why am I presenting you all this data? Because in the carnivore tribe, many people will tell you that LDL is not a risk marker. Because it's not. One plus or minus one percent of atherosclerotic plaque is constituted of cholesterol, LDL particles, foam cells, all of those combined. The only time that you are going to find plaque in people that is significantly constituted of LDL particles and cholesterol is people that exhibit familial hypercholesterolemia, which is a genetic condition that usually involves someone having an inability to sequester cholesterol or LDL particles from the bloodstream, which is why these people not only exhibit that LDL deposits via cytosis in their arteries, but also their eyelids and toes, okay? We also know that LDL are just the firemen that show up to the fire in order to help repair the cells that are damaged from things like elevated blood pressure, things like high blood sugar events, things like oxygen itself. We also know the most important detail here is that atherosclerosis only occurs in the arteries and not the veins, even though both the arteries and the veins carry the same cholesterol content, the same type of cholesterol are going through those pipes, let's say. We also know that even in the arterial side, atherosclerotic plaques only develop in set sites in the vasculature that you can predict, and it just so happens that those set sites are the exact areas of the vasculature that experience the most turbulence or eddying and swirling of blood when the heart pumps, which means that the pressure that is exerted in those areas occurs longer. We know that shear stress, so a more concentrated, isolated point of stress at an artery, is actually the least associated with atherosclerosis atherosclerosis. We know the etiology of heart disease. LDL is not a risk factor. Neither is cholesterol, neither are any of the lipoproteins, because LDL is not cholesterol. No secret that many people that follow a carnivore diet have high LDL levels. High is a relative term. That is with respect to a normative value that was imposed by the medical establishment at large in the 1950s and 60s, really. LDL is also, if I want to be extremely pedantic and accurate, not measured. It is estimated, which means it is based on a regression sum with an error around it. So you don't know what your LDL levels even are. How large is that error? I don't really know. But the fact is you cannot measure that. So what evidence do we have here that basically tells us that high LDL levels are probably not a good thing? Well, I'm so glad- Well, you don't have any. I'm sorry, sir. You do not have any. You asked because we have prospective court studies- No, those do not inform upon cause and effect relationships. As control trials- Neither do those. And Mendelian randomization trials- And in fact, neither do those. Basically show us that high LDL numbers are no bueno. No, that is an opinion that you stated and perhaps the authors stated as well, okay? They don't show you that at all. We covered that. 
would like to highlight one graph that combines... Actually, if you want to highlight one graph, let's highlight the largest associative data set ever aggregated by the British Heart Foundation and the World Health Organization working independently from each other, wherein they measured the total cholesterol and estimated and calculated the LDL levels for people in 168 different countries, meaning these are several hundred million data points around the world, and on the other axis plotted the age-adjusted death rates per 100,000 persons per year versus their cholesterol level, which showed that the lower your total cholesterol level was below 220 milligrams per deciliter, the higher the incidence of deaths were from all causes and from every sub-cause, including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. Now, of course, when people look at the graph, they'll see the trend occur the same way, proceeding the 220 value. However, the manifestation of that line on the graph is a result of the selection of a line of best fit, that is a calculated line based on the amount of data they actually collected. That does not represent actual data that was collected. It is the result and consequence of selecting a line of best fit for the data they did collect. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I hope that did. But I learned that in high school when I took statistics and calculus. I don't remember a lot from that, but I do remember that. All the data basically and summarizes really, really well. And that graph was extrapolated. That's actually why you can have a line, a parabola, with part of the line being in the negative x values and y values. It's just a line of best fit from the statement from the European Atherosclerosis Society. This is an opinion piece that is incessantly cited. At the top right corner of the paper, it says current opinion. What these authors did is they established and made up their own criteria for establishing causal relationships between something and said that LDL fit their criteria for causal relationships with respect to cardiovascular disease manifestations and presentations. That is what they did. I do not want to to look at this at all. I already covered that now. We're done. In 2017. On this graph, what you see right here is that the red line represents randomized controlled trials, the gray line is prospective cohort studies, and the blue line are Mendelian randomization studies. The graph reads as follows. The lower the LDL, the lower the risk for coronary heart disease. Not risk, sir. Covered that. The line that shows the greatest risk reductions are the genetic, not risk reductions. The genetic studies that were probably conducted in the exact same way as the LDL Mendelian randomization study. It's just nonsense. So the people that have low LDL levels from birth. Now, my point is that if you accept the fact that high... I think he meant high, not low pressure and high blood sugar levels are not good for you, and you rely on that argument on science, then you also have to accept the fact that high LDL levels are not good for you. No, you do not have to say that. I already covered all of this in this video. We know the mechanisms of atherosclerosis. We know them. We understand them very well. I've covered it in this video and many others. We also know the mechanisms as to how glucose induces damage. We know the mechanisms as to how high blood pressure will damage the arterial walls. What there is no mechanism of is how LDL induces damage, and there are no studies to suggest that LDL itself is the role of cardiovascular disease or a factor in it really okay perhaps people that are exhibiting those high LDL levels in the genetic population have a stimulus or multiple stimuli that are causing their genes to encode for the production of more LDL precisely due to the fact that those stimuli are harmful let's say and cause inflammation the inflammation causing heart disease or early death see you don't know that which is why you can't say cause LDL has not been established to be a cause of heart disease it is a lipoprotein carrier encoded by the body to be produced by your genes that have evolved for billions of years. <sighs> well, and you can turn a blind eye on LDL all you want, but again, that doesn't neglect the fact that this huge amount of evidence is huge amount of evidence. That is the most trite phrase any single person, including a four-year-old child, can say that. That doesn't mean anything. Saying huge amount of evidence doesn't mean that there is a huge amount of evidence. You just say that in order to beguile people into your ideology, okay? There, and it exists, whether you want it or not. What? Okay, there's evidence that has opinions in the conclusion written by authors that say that they believe that it is causal. Except they don't say that they believe it. They say that it is causal. It doesn't make it so. Your thoughts about this topic? Well, I just told you my thoughts on this topic. Free to let me know in the comment section. Well, I'll let you know right here. Thank you, as always, for watching. And You're welcome. I'll see you next time.
No, you won't. Maybe, but probably not. Okay, well, I hope that cleared some things up. I hope you learned something. Please binge my channel, my playlist, in fact, on my channel page called the Cholesterol and Heart Disease, something along those lines. And please go ahead and learn more about that there if you haven't already. Or you can buy my book, Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century. If you haven't bought that book already, to learn more about it as well. A ton about it. I can write a lot more in a book than I can say in a video. Also, once again, subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already. There's $2 month tier, a $5 month tier, and an $8 month tier in order to gain access to the same things that I just alluded to in the beginning. And also, the link on the bottom of the screen. What is that link? That is a link that will bring you to a fantastic site with fantastic products from a brand known as Cerule. If you want to learn more about those products, like what they do, who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, etc., etc., I compiled all that information into a great video called Cerule Products, which will be linked in the top right corner of the screen, which is a complete explanation of all of that. I would also recommend further migrating to the description to find a video done between myself and Professor Bart K on these products as well in further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself. If you decide to order products through that link, you will get 10% off your first order and any proceeding orders, as well as a permanent free shipping discount as well when signing up for monthly deliveries, which is also an amazing deal. But if you'd not like to purchase these products or would not like to subscribe to the Patreon, but you would like to still support me in my journey on this channel and growing the community ever more, I did open up a PayPal account and a GoFundMe account for anyone that would like to not have recurring payments and would just like to have a one-time payment option. Also, email me at gookie 14 and gmail.com if you have any other questions about literally, literally anything, such as, for example, how to earn your Cerule products for free, because who in the right mind wouldn't want that? So, with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that may very well be humble, but may not exactly know what they're talking about. So, till then.